This is Pastor Bono speaking, and again I say to each and every one of you, praise the Lord. I greet you in that wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who made it possible for you and I to worship together again by the way of television, coming into your hearts and homes. It's my pleasure to bring you another message from the Word of God. Last week, I taught a lesson from my office here at Solomon's Temple, and I'm doing the same thing this week because I think the matter that is before the house is so critical until the attention of the world should be brought to bear and to deal with the problem that is before the house. My subject last week, the master and his slave, I pointed out the fact that the beating that was given to Rodney King in California by the police officers was the master beating his slave. And of course, since that time, there has been another occurrence in California of full police brutality of the same nature that took place in the case of Rodney King. Now, I told you that this is something that happens every week across the nation of this great America of ours. Every week, there are such cases of police brutality as it relates to race, white against black. I'm blessed here at Solomon's Temple to have in my congregation both white and black. I have uh, some white parishioners and, and black parishioners. And one of my assistant pastors here at Solomon's Temple is white. His name is Reuben, Elder Reuben. He's one of our junior bishops of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And being my assistant here at Solomon's Temple, I spoke with him and asked him if he would come with me and help me to make this telecast. I thought it would be more fruitful and a tremendous blessing to those of you in the land of television. Fruitful because of the fact that uh, he knows one side of the fence and I know the other. And we're going to talk about the two sides of the fence, white and black. And I think we might be able to articulate something here that will bless every one of you in the land of television. Now, I understand last week that I had so many calls of people who were very uh, aggravated by what I said, provoked, and some people were just downright angry and said they will never listen to me again. Uh, they would turn the television off for all kinds of reactions to uh, the master and his slave. Well, we're going one step further today. We're going to both sides of the fence, the white side and the black side. Now, I want this understood before I proceed, and that is my assistant pastor, uh, Junior Bishop Rubin, is one of the rare white men that I've ever met that rose above the problem of race and see people as people. See people as people through the eyes of God. Or otherwise, he could not be my assistant pastor. I admire him. I have great respect for him because I know he has dealt with the problem within himself. And he has risen above the problem, and he has so much to offer to those of us on both sides of the fence. So tonight I'm going to share that with you. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, Elder Rubin. Praise the Lord, Bishop. How are you? Doing real fine, sir. I believe you uh, participated in one of the periods of America in which we had upheavals uh, yes, sir. such as we had in California. Uh, 
And you're talking about how many years, sir? Uh, 25 years ago. About 25 years ago. Yes, sir. Which means that you actually witness the racial upheavals that we have had here in America to the extent that you actually went into what part of the services to work? In the late 60s, in 1967, I served as a VISTA volunteer, which was a part of the Great Society, the anti-poverty um, movement of the late 60s, which was, I suppose, a reaction in part to the uh, uprisings in, in the 1960s. Served as a VISTA volunteer in service to America. It was described as the Domestic Peace Corps. And I was born and raised in Patterson, but was assigned as a VISTA to a um, Central Jersey area, the um, fact where I eventually pastored a church in Englishtown, New Jersey. All right. Um, this uh, VISTA program mm -hmm. came out of the Great Society. Yes, sir. Correct. Um, much talk has come to the minds of the Americans relating to that Great Society mm -hmm. program that came out of the 60s. Uh, I understand Mr. Fitzwater uh, said that uh, the problems of today in California, the results of the programs uh, put in place by President Lyndon Johnson, mm -hmm. who is the father of the Great Society concept. Mm -hmm. uh, working in that program, looking back at the problems today, do you think that that program was a good program? Yes, I do, sir. Uh, it was a positive program uh, that offered not only hope but skills. It, it offered an opportunity for individuals to develop themselves and to prepare themselves for the future. What was the reception you received in the black community working through this program? It was positive. Um, at first, caution, first, uh, why are you here type of thing. Part of the program uh, dictated that the ind individual in VISTA had to live in the community in which they were going to work mm -hmm. and had to live uh, an economic level of poverty. We received um, about $50 a week. That was, that was our salary. So we lived in the community. The community waited. They just waited to see why we were there and what our intent was but it became more and more positive as we remained. You all won the community over? Won the community. <laughs> uh, Lyndon Bing Johnson, a Southern uh, politician, mm -hmm. dealt with the major problems of the inner city at that time in a way that I have never seen it since that time. Mm -hmm. uh, since that time, uh, we have had many major upheavals in the inner cities. Uh, for instance, we have a chart here we would like to just look at from, for a moment. We have a chart, and uh, it says it happened in Watts in 1965, in Detroit 1967, Washington, D.C., 1968, and Harlem, Miami, Atlanta, Chicago, Birmingham, and many other cities, of course. We're talking about 27 years since Watts. 27 years have come and gone. And we are no closer now to a solution than we were then. What do you think is a problem? The programs that have been developed and those that have developed the programs have perhaps in part wanted 
to solve the problem. But in reality, I have to feel that people really aren't looking for real solutions to an everlasting problem. Um, perhaps a band-aid approach so there's no more riots or upheavals, but not really concerned uh, about solving the problem, nor do I believe they really are aware of what the problem is. Uh, we, we live in a, a country where there's more than one society, more than one group of people, and it's looked at from two different sets of eyes. The master and the slave concept yes, sir. That, that, uh, uh, that we have before us, uh, do you think the master isn't interested in solving uh, the problem? A master, I guess, wants his slave to provide for the master. I doubt very much that the master is concerned about the well-being of, of the slave. slave. Now, in my conveying this concept and, 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 and belief, uh, it, it crawls swords with quite a few people. It, it upset quite a few people. That in this America, so America of ours, that at this late date, the master and slave concept is very much alive, but no one wants to admit <laughs> that it is alive. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, uh, we could have solved the problem uh, to the extent that upheaval, such as we have just seen in Los Angeles, could not take place today. It is obvious uh, that the, the racist element of, of our American society doesn't want but just so much change. Enough change to keep things cool, mm -hmm. but not enough change to elevate the poor black in the inner city or any other place to the level of whites. Now, it is stated in our Constitution that all of us are created equal. Uh, do you believe that at any time in our future that we headed for that equality? We're not on that pathway now. Um, I don't know that it's ever going to adjust to get on that path, uh, but we're not heading there now. Now, from, from where you sit, mm -hmm. uh, you sit on the master side, <laughs> <laughs> and well. I'm sitting on the slave side. Uh, go back to your childhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, you was raised as a, a white person mm -hmm. in uh, somewhat of an affluent, affluent society. Uh, middle class. Middle class. <laughs> All right. Uh, you enjoyed uh, a lifestyle that white people normally enjoy in, in that middle class group in America. Tell me, um, when you enlisted in the uh, VISTA program, Yes, sir. Here you are in an environment, the master among the slaves. How did you feel? How do I feel, master? Well, I don't know that I felt uh, like the master among the slaves, but the thoughts that I, I do remember moving into this community and recognizing the problems that I never considered existing. Uh, people actually not having enough to eat. People actually not having opportunities in school, in job opportunities. It, it was really shocking to me that there was a whole part of society um, in the same town, 
in the same state, in the same country, that just didn't have the same opportunities. I've mentioned it to, to, many times in conversation. Many things that I took for granted, I found out there was a whole part of America that just didn't see that as a possibility. That was shocking to me. It was alarming to me. It was of great concern to me. It, it didn't make sense to me. When you saw this, you, you got your hands in it. Mm -hmm. You got your feet in it, mm -hmm. your mind and everything. Mm -hmm. Did that have a negative effect or a positive effect? I don't think it had a negative effect. It had one of concern, one of that, that upset me. Um, it made me very concerned about, is there a solution to the problem? You worked in the Lyndon Bain Johnson program for the inner city. Do you think uh, that those programs uh, that you worked in and the programs developed by the Great Society concept, had they continued until today, where would we be? More individuals, I believe, would have been given the opportunity to, to widen their horizons. More individuals would have been given the opportunity to take advantage of the same thing that other folks have been taking advantage of for a period of time. I think the loss to the programs has been to the negative to our country and to many individuals in our society. I greatly admired uh, uh, President Johnson for various reasons, and, and among the many reasons, is that I really actually felt that he understood the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you look at politicians, you don't know when they're telling the truth, you, you don't know when they're sincere, uh, because they're politicians. They will, they will play the race game just to win a, an election. They will play race against race just to win an election. We have seen this in America. Uh, I, I doubted Lyndon Bain Johnson at first, mm -hmm. after the death of President Kennedy, and he came into the presidency. I doubted him, but he made me a believer because of the programs that he implemented. And those programs that he implemented, some of them are still in force mm -hmm. today, and they have borne tremendous fruit mm -hmm. and had all of those programs uh, given to us by President Johnson been implemented and followed through through the presidencies of all the Republicans as well as Democrats you know where we would be today we would be sitting on top of a mound of hope and inspiration a mound of of positiveness, excitement. So many people would have escaped the turmoil of the inner city and would have risen uh, to taste of the pie on the table and would have enjoyed it and would have become a part of this area of America that people see people as people and not white and black. Could we talk about that a minute um, as it relates to, to, to white and black? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to uh, make you uncomfortable. Do uh, um, <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Um, in this uh, situation that we have, this racial situation that we have. Um, do you think that most Americans on your side can rise above it? <laughs> My side, huh? Yes. On the master's side. On the master's side. Yeah. They haven't yet. And, and un unfortunately, um, 
people, because of their indoctrination, because of their experiences, because of what they've been taught, haven't seemed to be able to really move from what you uh, explain as the, the master slave syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, I think individuals can be taught to share. I think individuals can be taught to support programs. But I hesitate to go as far as that being totally broke down. Uh, out. But in saying that, I've got to keep some hope. Got to keep some hope that perhaps it will change. Right. When you became involved in the uh, inner city problems, mm -hmm. how did your people feel about that? My family? Yes. They saw it probably as a, a noble effort. But again, probably as a master slave type of situation, uh, charity work or, or something of that order. But I did want to comment the white community of where I was assigned w was very upset with me. The white community was upset. With they were upset. Troublemaker. That's what they call you. Well, they call me worse than that, but uh, <laughs> they call me a lot of things. <laughs> but they didn't call you nigger lovers, did you? Occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things uh, that the master calls uh, any mm -hmm. any white person mm -hmm. uh, that shows any type of feeling mm -hmm. uh, for the black mm -hmm. society, which is the the, the, the slave. Uh, for some reason or other, for some reason. The people who registered, registered with you, that negative feeling mm -hmm. about your working with blacks, uh, did they feel that uh, you should leave them alone, uh, stay away from them, on the basis of what? They had a good thing going. There was this master-slave relationship. Mm -hmm. Why are you going to stir up the slaves? Why are you going to start problems? Why are you going to create problems? Um, Which mean let sleeping dogs lie. Mm -hmm. We've got a good don't, system here. Leave don't it alone. awaken this giant. Mm -hmm. Let him sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the uh, police chief called me in, sat me down, and wanted to know what my role was. Um, got traffic tickets, parking tickets. Just because you were working. Mm -hmm. in the black community. Mm -hmm. uh, never got beyond that. I never had any major confrontations. Why do you think the police chief got involved in trying to understand why you were there? Is this the master again uh, trying to say uh, to his white brother, that you're going the wrong direction? Leave, I believe so. Leave these people alone? Because initially, those that spoke to me, spoke to me on a positive, in a positive manner and saying, we want to help you. Don't get involved. Um, when I rejected that advice, they became upset. But initially, it was... Your young that, man won't look out. That's how you got those parking tickets. That's <laughs> I got the parking tickets. Uh, now, giving your parking tickets was supposed to do what to you? I guess that was a signal, a sign, uh, back off. Back off.